Hi, I'm Sean Donahue from Sydney, Australia, and I work at the Garvin Institute of Medical Research and also affiliated with UNSW and CSRO's Data61. In this presentation, I'm excited to share with you our work on systematic modeling of SARS-CoV-2 protein structures. This is part of an ongoing international collaboration with researchers also at the Technical University of Munich in Germany, as well as UCL and the University of Dundee in UK. So I'm going to talk very briefly about the modeling strategy that we used, a little bit about the data sets involved. Most of I'm going to talk about uh, strategies we've developed to visually explore these data and a web-based resource called Aquaria that we've integrated them into. I'm also going to talk very briefly about the, some of the insights we've gained into COVID infection. Uh, and finally, I'm going to finish with a few words on how some of the uh, insights we've gained might be able to help accelerate COVID research generally. So our analysis began with the 14 protein sequences given by Uniprot that comprise the uh, viral proteome. So we took each of these sequences and attempted to match every part of those sequences against all the available protein structures in, across all organisms using the machine learning methods outlined below. And this generated a data set of 872 uh, sequence structure alignments. Now, on the one hand, this is great. This gives us a wealth of new data about molecular mechanisms in COVID. Um, that's not readily available from other related resources. But on the other hand, it also gives us a new problem. How do we take such a large and complex data set and make it actually usable and useful for other researchers? Uh, essentially, our solution to the problem was to invent a novel layout for these data uh, based around the organization of the viral genome. And the next few slides, I'm going to introduce you to elements of this layout, beginning with one of the viral proteins, a protein called NSP3. So in NSP3, our analysis found uh, a region called the macro domain that had 144 matching structures. Now, many of these matching structures were like this. They were the structure of related viral proteins. And um, in fact, most of the structures we're going to be looking at are going to be like this. They're going to be different from the actual COVID-19 sequence. And so to be clear about these differences, we highlight every amino acid residue position where there's a substitution with a dark gray coloring. Across most of the proteome, the best structures derive from the SARS virus. Uh, as you see immediately with the same visual encoding, um, that this is a better model to uh, COVID-19 uh, sequence. This structure actually also contains an insertion, a region of the sequence that's not present in COVID-19. Um, and so we highlight inserted regions with uh, light gray coloring. Um, now, in fact, for this particular domain, the macro domain, there are actually already some structures that have been determined for the COVID-19 um, macro domain. And so here's one of them. And as you see, no, no black marks. So that's actually the structure of the COVID-19 region. Um, and in every case where we have a match, we ha choose one thumbnail image, and this is usually the structure with the highest sequence identity to the COVID-19 sequence. So this is the structure that we chose to represent the 144 structures that match in that region. Now, the macro domain turns out to be quite interesting for a number of reasons. So one is that of the 144 structures, 56 of them match to, to, to viral proteins, but others um, match to host proteins, including 47 that match to human proteins. So one way to read this graph is it says that the viral macro domain potentially mimics these human proteins. Going back to the NSP3 sequence, uh, we found an additional five regions of, those, of the sequence that also had matching structures. And one of the more interesting ones was the PL Pro domain that had 38 matching structures. In this case, all 38 matching structures matched to viral proteins. Um, but in some cases, those structures also had viral proteins bound to human proteins. So a way to read this part of the graph is that the PL Pro domain may potentially hijack these human proteins. So again, returning to the sequence, um, this still leaves three regions where we had no structural matches. This means that the sequences in these regions was not detectably similar to anything that has ever been solved by experimental structure determination methods. So we call these regions dark regions, indicating that we have almost no knowledge about macromolecular conformation. So when we repeat this analysis across all of the proteins from COVID-19, uh, we see that uh, the dark regions account for perhaps like a third of the proteome. Uh, and of the remaining, uh, remainder two, remaining two thirds, um, this graph effectively summarizes everything we know structurally about, um, about the, the proteome. In addition, we've also highlighted in the graph every case where we have evidence of 
uh, potential mimicry of, uh, of human proteins or hijacking of human proteins that are supported by structural evidence. So we integrated this graph into a web-based resource called Aquaria. Um, and in the next few slides, I'm going to um, show you a screencast taken from the website uh, and as a tour through how to use the site to explore this, these data sets. So we've zoomed in here to the spike glycoprotein. In this region, we have 121 matching structures, all to viral proteins, and some of those proteins uh, were, were bound to human proteins. And most famously, uh, we have the hijacking of the ACE2 receptor. So if we click on that, we come to the spike glycoprotein Aquaria page. This shows all the matching structures that we have, where they match onto the full length sequence of spike glycoprotein. We see that there's 34 structures only that, that match to most of the sequence, and only three structures actually that have most of the sequence matched and also contain a, um, are bound to ACE, the ACE2 receptor. Um, so if we look back up now at the structure, we see that in Aquaria, by default, uh, initially we show only one chain of a complex structure like this. This is to help uh, simplify the initial task of understanding how the chain folds and, and how it relates to the, uh, the sequence. Um, notice also there's many black marks on this structure. So this is not the structure of COVID-19 spike glycoprotein. In fact, it's the structure of the SARS uh, version of the spike glycoprotein. So effectively, the black marks indicate the differences between SARS and COVID-19 spike glycoprotein. Now, to, um, to see the whole structure, we simply double click on the background. This sort of zooms to that view. Uh, here we can now more clearly see the ACE2 receptor at the top, and we see how it binds to one of the trimers. Um, to get back, we just double click on any part of one chain, and that brings us back to that view where we focus on a single chain. So in Aquaria, we can also map sequence features onto the 3D structure fairly easily. Uh, we have a feature tab down here, and we're going to go now to uh, look at Uniprot features. Uh, we have a range of them, but we're going to go down and choose just the domain features just for now. And that's going to color the, the structure by regions. Hovering over here can tell us the name of the domain and provide a link to more information. Um, it can be more informative for domains to, to look at a, another set. We have the CAF um, uh, feature collection. And this not only has sometimes more features, but has more detail about every features, including the function, uh, interactive graphic actually showing the functions of these domains, as well as the, the phylogenetic uh, distribution. And, and another interesting collection is the predict protein set. Lots of uh, useful predictions about protein properties, but we're going to look at the conservation scores mapped onto the structure. We can see in the red or brown color, uh, the sort of central core to the trimer that's highly conserved. And then there's low breach in the context ACE2. We can see that that's um, very much not conserved. Returning to the graph layout, and now let's move up to the, uh, the mid portion of the genome. And we see one protein here has some very interesting interactions. It's got some potential mimicry going on, and those mimic proteins are potentially being uh, hijacking uh, other interactions in, in human and the human cells. So let's look at this uh, particular uh, potential mimic of the AQR protein and how it may hijack the interaction with the spliceosome. So click on, clicking on here, this will open up um, a structure of AQR bound to the spliceosome, but, but using the viral sequence uh, and mapping it on to that structure. And so here we can see the region of this complex structure where the viral protein matches. And that would be the region that's shown now in uh, with the coloring over there. And a gray, remember, is non-aligned parts of the structure. So that's AQR. Most of it actually doesn't align onto the virus. It's only one so small subdomain. And notice that the region that uh, doesn't align is the region that actually contacts directly with the spliceosome. So based on this structure, we'd say there's no real evidence that the viral protein would directly bind to the spliceosome, but it could still hijack the function of AQR, which is actually to ligate RNA uh, during exon splicing. And actually, there's been a very a few very recent publications uh, showing that uh, RNA viruses can actually create chimeric proteins, uh, combining both viral and, and host uh, proteins together in uh, one in one protein. Um, and the potential hijacking of AQR might uh, indicate one of the mechanisms involved in the creation of these chimeras, which would be exciting. Um, Finally, let's go to the, uh, the beginning of the genome and look again at the macrodomain and look in more detail at one of the proteins that the macrodomain may be hijacking, the uh, macro H2A1. So clicking on this, we now see the pr pr uh, structure of human macro H2, H2A1. 
uh, where we've mapped on the viral sequence uh, to, to sort of see how it compares. To find out more about that, that micro H2A1, let's click on that chain. This will take us to the same structure, but now we, instead of mapping viral sequence, we're gonna map the human sequence. So this will be a one-to-one -one mapping, so we should see no black marks. And we can understand now uh, a bit more about the structure of this protein. It has a C-terminal domain, which corresponds to the macro domain, a linking region with no structures, and a C-terminal, an N-terminal region rather with, um, it has a very familiar structure. This is actually one of the core components of the nucleosome complex. Which, which leads to an interesting speculation that coronaviruses may influence the epigenomic state of host cells via mimicry of either the macro H2A1 or others proteins in that, in that list. <clears throat> so that concludes our quick tour of the new resource, which is freely available online for you to explore at queria.ws slash COVID. And with that, I want to add some final thoughts on how we can accelerate COVID research. Here's a speculation. Perhaps we already have gathered the data we need to make a significant breakthrough in treatment of this disease. Maybe we've, we've even already done all the analysis we need, perhaps even using machine learning processes such as described in this work. Even worse, maybe we've got the, these data and these analysis results already available online in one of the many uh, data resources um, that, and infrastructure that are available. But what's missing is we haven't organized those data visually in a way that uh, uh, researchers in the field can clearly see these, these insights. I personally believe that data visualization is one of the rate limiting steps um, impeding COVID research. Um, then again, I am probably biased as I have spent the last 20 years building the required talent stack, um, but I'm not alone. And together with colleagues, we've created uh, um, an initiative aimed at improving the standard of data visualization in the life sciences. And over the last 10 years, we've produced a, a range of outcomes designed to be useful for biologists and biomedical researchers. Now, in the context of the pandemic, we're planning a series of focused discussions, uh, especially with teams who are creating research infrastructures, with the common theme being how can data visualization help accelerate COVID research? Uh, to find out more, go to our blog. And for those uh, who are involved in developing research infrastructure, I, I would encourage you, please, to get in contact. Um, and um, we also anticipate that some of these discussions are, are going to spill over into the upcoming VISB conference in March next year. So um, that covers all the points I want to address. So all that remains is for me to thank the organizations that have funded this work and to thank my collaborators and finally to invite your questions and comments about our work.